Okay, so uh, we have in this session, we have four speakers. Each speaker will get 15 minutes of time for presentation and five minutes for question and answer. We'll try to maintain this timing. And without further delay, I'd like to call our first speaker. The first speaker is Dr. Tagwa Musa, and the presentation title is Integration of Engineering Societies for Sustainable Development Goals, Engineering Practice Approach. Dr. Tagwa Musa, are you ready? Yes, sure. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my, my project. Just a minute, can you see my screen now? Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see, madam, we can see. Okay, thank you so much. So, hello, hello everyone. I'm Tagwa Musa, I'm from Sudan. I'm from Sudan University of Science and Technology. I'm going to talk uh, about a specific case we implemented in my university, and I think it may just uh, give some impact uh, among the engineering students. Um, my title is Integration of Engineering Societies for Sustainable Development Goals, Engineering Community Building Approach. Uh, but, uh, I'm going to, to go through several points, including production and background, and I will be very quick in this. And the story of international uh, or uh, integration of sustainable engineering societies, and uh, the goal and objectives, and community building approach, and I'm talking to share some activities during three years, and uh, we can see together if integration of sustainable engineering societies make any impact among the students, and uh, there is conclusion and way forward. Uh, I will start with uh, this. Uh, uh, this slide is just the geographical area of the case. It is in Sudan. Uh, I know maybe most of you or all of you familiar with Sudan. I, you know where is Sudan, but just as a reminder, Sudan is a country in Africa. It's located in the east of Africa. Sometimes they, some agencies describe it as in North Africa and others describe it as in, uh, in Middle Africa, which means Sudan has a strategic location in Africa. And uh, I don't know also if you know anything about, uh, about Sudan, but Sudan is famous uh, with the River Nile, which is the tallest uh, river uh, around the, the world. And uh, we have uh, so many other, other uh, very important resources. Uh, including agriculture, and we have uh, livestock wells. The, the land of Sudan, 57% are suitable for agriculture, according to UN World uh, Food Program. And uh, also Sudan is known for oil production, and uh, the reserve is more than 5 billion barrels, and there are so many minerals. And recently, maybe uh, uh, most of you hear about Sudan Revolution, which uh, started in 2018, at the end of 2018, and just ended uh, a government for more than 30 years. So uh, the, the case study was in Sudan University of Science and Technology, which is a public university located in Khartoum, and it has more than 25 colleges, 11 centers, and six deanships among, among distributed amongst 10 campuses, just Sudan University of Science and Technology, distributed among uh, 10 campuses. And there are more than 200 academic programs actually for undergraduate and postgraduates. And student population are uh, in undergraduate and postgraduates are uh, 72K according to 2018 statistics. Among these 25 colleges, there are five uh, colleges for engineering. And here is the main problem, really because these five engineering problems uh, five engineering colleges has uh, 29 programs, but distributed in five colleges among three campuses. And the campus is, is uh, a little bit far from each other. So we have a uh, college of water and environmental engineering, where there are two departments about water and environment, and there is petroleum and mining engineering. And I belong to this college, uh, where there are four departments. And we have our architectural planning with two departments. We have industrial engineering, 
uh, and uh, technology, where there are four departments, including chemical, laser, plastic, and polymer. And we have College of Engineering, where there are 17 uh, engineering programs, including all the other disciplines you, you, you know in our, around the world. Uh, so these 29 programs, including most of engineering disciplines, uh, that none for every one of you. And uh, the study uh, for, uh, for this integration of sustainable engineering societies is uh, started in January 2020, where I have a meeting with the society we call Society of Petroleum Engineers. And uh, in the, uh, there we have a student chapter for this SPE, which is an international organization and well-known society around the world. And I asked them if they know anything. I, I just asked them to link their activities with uh, sustainable development goals. And they started to ask me, what is SDGs? Well, we don't know. So I asked uh, if they hear about them. No, they don't know anything. And I asked them if, have any, if they have any collaboration with other engineering societies among uh, Sudan University of Science and Technology. And I found them, they don't know anything. I, they, they don't have any other uh, or collaboration with any other society. And even they don't know any other society working to promote uh, sustainable development goals. So uh, I'm familiar with, uh, and I, I witnessed the sanction on Sudan. And I know the sanction for more than 20 years, our students are, are too far from any international uh, work or international participation. When they participate even in, in some co uh, contents and competitions, or even conferences. Sometimes they just exclude it because they are from Sudan. So I know this very well, and I know they are very far, and just I think to, to take action on this. Uh, because, uh, but I, I also ask myself, is it only for Society of Petroleum Engineers, or we, are, we should include other disciplines? Because I know a silos organization, the setup of, of this classification in engineering disciplines uh, it's just a hinder efforts of much needed collaboration. So it is, it is too difficult for them to, to understand anything if, uh, because this, this silos arrangement uh, often finds their ways into students' engineering groups. They are in, uh, petroleum engineers, they have no any relationship with electrical engineers, and there is no any uh, even relationship with chemical engineers, and, and just like that. So uh, this really is a uh, uh, is uh, the uh, limit learning opportunities of well-rounded education provided by exposure and experience of interdisciplinary learning approaches for participating students. So I started to think to link all these students to promote together and to, to work together to promote sustainable development goals and other uh, learning approaches that can help students. So I started to communicate with other engineering students to link these societies in one body. And uh, at that time, my student and my friend, Fatma Jalal, I hope she is, she is attending this, uh, uh, this uh, presentation because really she helped a lot to introduce some uh, other so, uh, societies in, from the College of Engineering because I, I belong to Petroleum Engineering College and I don't have that much engagement with the students from other colleges. But she helped me a lot to invite some uh, student chapters. And we begin with uh, nine, nine societies. Uh, one of them from College of Industrial and, and uh, in, uh, Industrial Engineering and Technology, which is IEOM. And this is Betro Society of Petroleum Engineers. And there are seven from College of Engineering. We started uh, integration of sustainable engineering societies as a body and the main aim is uh, to break in the silos of encourage, uh, and encouraging formation of collaborative environments between various students in engineering societies. And we set, we set together uh, five goals, included uh, or six, to provide an opportunity for sustainable engineering societies to develop better understanding of SDGs and also to link our students, engineering students with international organizations, because as, as I said, sanction just let them they have no any relationship with outside, uh, only minor, minor, maybe minor co uh, co cooperation, and also to promote the importance of science scientific societies for more engagement in professional activities and community service. Also, 
uh, to disseminate the culture of sustainability in the university learning environment and work as integration. Uh, the other two is to build a sense of belonging, belonging among such students so they can share ideas, fully contribute and confidently speak up and to create a spirit of creativity, uh, participation, working in a team and linking the various engineering disciplines to achieve the goals of integration and build their social and emotional learning. So to, to, uh, to gain these objectives, uh, I think about community building approach. And as you know, community building is a field of practice directed toward the creation or enhancement of community of, among individual, individuals within a regional area or with a common interest. It is a practice that foster connection and a sense of belonging between people with similar interests or position. And it is just very uh, common and it is very good for uh, approach for, for, uh, in, for our work in this, uh, in this area. So we started to think about the leadership. Uh, just think, think with me. The main problem is uh, students with different backgrounds from different colleges, from different departments, and every student just think he's the best one, and every society think they should lead because they are, they are, uh, their discipline or their uh, department is the better department or something like that. So I tried as maximum as possible to promote uh, the fellowship between the students and let them just uh, work in a friendly uh, way. And I, I tried as maximum as possible to attend most of the meeting uh, and uh, to work really to, to let them just understand each other. Uh, this is a container, just a container. They adjust it uh, with this uh, table and some chairs. So we, we used to, to take all our, our meeting in this container. And uh, I think to make it a horizontal body instead of, uh, of a vertical body without uh, there is a president and vice president. And this also because it will give a little bit uh, competition between the different societies. So we make it a horizontal body directed by a council. And the members of the council are the society's presidents and headed by the faculty advisor. And I just assign myself as a faculty advisor and try to work in this direction. So all the activities should be directed by a committees uh, with representatives from all the societies. That is the idea how we, we built our work. Uh, and uh, the activities, we focus at the beginning only on celebrating the World Engineering Day, because in 2020, it is the first time that UNESCO asked uh, the organization to celebrate the World Engineering Day in March 4. So we are in, in January. So it started just to focus on celebrating the World Engineering Day. And in 2020, we are only organization and, and the first one in Sudan to celebrate World Engineering Day. So our activities were exhibitions and, and seminars. We asked them that the exhibitions should be innovative models and, and support at least one SDGs. And uh, seminars also, the, the seminar topic and talks should link to the sustainable development goals. So the students prepare their talks accordingly. And uh, SDGs just everywhere, there are so many posters uh, in the exhibitions and on the roads uh, inside the universities. And every society given a corner to introduce themselves to the new students because uh, the students, they don't know about their societies and, and uh, this is also an issue and one of the objectives. And also tried as maximum as possible to collaborate with international bodies. So in 2020, we focused to spread the awareness of SDGs and link the students from different societies uh, together uh, for multidis multidisciplinary teamwork. There are more than uh, 2,000 students and faculty participated in this and uh, in the exhibition and seminars. So, and some students share the, their success stories. And uh, we conducted 12, 12 seminars on campus. If you see this, you see all the, uh, the, the societies are there because they, they did not agree to, all, all of them just, they want their logos to be there. So we, we put their logos and, and they work very well. The re realization, we have so many, we achieved a lot from this activity. 
because at, after the end of the program, we ask all the societies, especially the student chapters that are, are a part of other or international organizations to include all these activities as collaborators in their reports. So the, the result is a 2020 Silver Award for international for uh, IUM student chapter, industrial and operation management student chapter uh, in our university. And Society of Petroleum Engineers Sudan section uh, gets the presidential award uh, because of this, this report. The, all the students, of course, they have uh, certificates. These certificates are, are uh, signed from, from the international bodies. And at that time, is Global Engineering Dean's Council and Inter International Federation of Engineering Education Societies and Association of uh, uh, World Bioenergy Association. Uh, I'm, about, I'm a part of DDC and IP, then my colleague, Dr. Hazir Faru, uh, she's a part of WBA, uh, and uh, she helped us also to include WBA to be a part of this, of this organization, of, of this activity. Also, the winner of the best, we have the best projects in the exhibition uh, was featured in uh, IFIS DDC Global Engineer Bulletin. And uh, in 2021, we go, uh, we did 17 webinars virtual. The students from water and environment disciplines form a society and join the, uh, the integration. That means now we are 10. Uh, there is growth in all the societies membership. And we also collaborate with the new international partner, which is University of Emerging Technologies and tried as maximum as possible to promote, to promote emerging technologies among our activities. So this is the poster. Also, all the the logos of the of the societies are there. The same was engineering for a healthy planet. Uh, all the seminars just uh, focus on the healthy planet, and the emerging technologies was there. That in these for the live sessions are thirty to 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 fifty, while they are more than one thousand views on YouTube. A quick assistant. Doctor Tagua, uh, yeah? uh, the time is almost uh, finished. Uh, yeah, okay, please, okay. Uh, kindly uh, conclude. Yeah, it. yeah, I will try. Yes. I will okay. try. Yeah, okay. A quick assist assessment was done for 2021. We found that uh, there are more than 500 students participated. 45 percent. Uh, they said they heard the, for the first time about SDGs from from. Uh, integration activities and 30% were members of scientific societies, only 30%. In 2020, there are additional two societies were joined. Uh, so now we have 12 societies. The same, we talk about this engineering for sustainable development. Uh, the, we increase the activities time for three days, exhibitions, and they are 30, more than 30 offline and online seminars. We have new contributor, international contributor, and uh, partnership. The focus uh, on the project uh, and seminars address real problems from Sudanese communities. So this is uh, different. The student receive certificate from the partners. If you see the poster here, you see we don't have the, the participant societies logos. We only have integration logo. And this is, I think, progress we did. And we make on uh, just we, uh, we uh, maybe we just remove all the borders. And the students that graduated during the last two years participated in all the three days activities. And after uh, after the event, many applications from other other uh, engineering disciplines start to, to form their own society just because they want to join integration of sustainable engineering societies. And there are even some uh, students group from outside the university, they started to ask our help. So as conclusion and way forward, Integration of sustainable engineering societies help in breaking the gap between different engineering disciplines in SAS. And uh, uh, the integration succeed in uh, disseminating the culture of working in difference to SDGs because no any society now they can work without linking their activities to SDGs. And uh, also the integration becomes the main box for the Sudan University of Science and Technology Peace Engineering Eco Hub, which is the first and the only one engineering hub for, uh, for uh, our eco hub uh, around the world now. And that is working to solve real problems from community using the community service learning approach. And the, the integration council identified another activity now to focus on building research group. Uh, the current project 
we are working on is waste management where all the, the students can participate and all the, the societies can be a part of it. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'm sorry to, to have additional two minutes. I will stop sharing now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tagwa. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing your wonderful experience. So, uh, so far, uh, we do not have any questions uh, from the audience. And if is there any question from the speakers, you can ask. We have still have one minute. So, uh, so far I understand that you, uh, you have a lot of activities uh, that you have shared here. So, uh, from these activities, uh, is, is there any way to, to include any revision in the curriculum in your institute, Dr. Tagwa? Yeah, okay, thank you so much. This is really very important question. Uh, the main, the main problem and the main challenge to how to to convince others to change their curriculum to include some kind of uh, practical work. Uh, uh, just we succeed on to 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 take the attention of the high level of uh, the leadership of the university, and they started to come to our to our uh, events and attend the uh, opening ceremony and even go through the through the exhibitions and give some comments. Maybe, maybe just slowly, uh, we are going just to include something uh, in the curriculum. But, but through the, uh, as, as I said, in, uh, we said I have uh, so the Peace Engineering Eco Hub. Through this Peace Engineering Eco Hub, we try to, to give the students uh, sessions, just, uh, just a theory about the, the main knowledge about waste management. And after they finish their first six months, we call it this is phase one of the project. After they finish this, the students go outside to the community to implement their, their knowledge in a real world. So in this kind, I think, but this is not, is not, is not uh, the students, if they like to join, they can join. It is just open by, it's not compulsory for every student. Okay. But I think also it will help to break this gap and help the student to, to work with the community in practice okay. way. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Thank Thakwa, you. again. So now we so like- Just I have one question, Professor Mashuk. Yeah, we are kind of uh, out of time. Okay. So maybe he uh, can uh, personally ask her. Okay, so just uh, like oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I like to move our second move to our second speaker, Dr. Astra Fatima, and the title presentation title is "Defining and Achieving Institutional Effectiveness for Transformational Education." And so can I share she, my screen? And she is from Lord Institute of Engineering and Technology, an expert in construction engineering and management. Yes. Uh, Dr. Astra Fatima, please uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, it is visible. Please yeah. proceed. Is it visible? Everyone can view? Yeah, I can. we can hear you and it is visible. Okay. You so can go I welcome screen. you all for my uh, session. Uh, good evening, everyone. Today is like uh, my topic is on defining and achieving institutional effectiveness for transformation education. I Dr. To Fatima, uh, yes. okay. uh, your, even though your screen are visible, but your slide is very small because uh, you didn't go full screen or full screen. Can it's you full screen only, to... sir. Full screen, mm -hmm. I have opted for slideshow. Okay. Uh, any other can, can see the full screen? Because I, I cannot still... No, it is the same for me also. Perhaps uh, she needs to run the slide. Oh, that's what I'm doing. Actually, I have opted slideshow. In slideshow, from the beginning, I'm opting. And actually, for me, it is full screen. But for the others, it is not. 
Okay, yeah. you can, what you can do, you can, uh, you can click on the right bottom corner. That, okay. uh, that, that is scale. Ah, uh, yes, 50%, that, then we have, uh, yeah, slideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah, offer yeah. slideshow, right? Now, is it visible? I'm not sure if this is from the lag, uh, because your voice is very clear, but the slide is still very small. Yeah, it's coming. Can you uh, increase the... Achha, zoom, can I increase zoom? the percentage? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Is that's that better. Now? Yes, yeah, that's okay. better. That's uh, sorry to interrupt. Here. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Asra, yeah. Asra Fatima, uh, please yeah. go under share screen and choose the screen of your presentation. Yeah, that's what I did. Actually, I opted. We have a home insert design animation no, and slideshow, no, no, right? No, no. You are on okay. the Zoom, right? You are on the Zoom, right? Huh. You are under the Zoom. You have a screen, shared screen, green letters written, right? Share screen on the Zoom. Yeah, we have. Yeah. yeah. Press it. Then you'll find the PPT. Press that PPT. It's okay. At first, you have to unshare. Stop sharing. Achha, stop Wait. sharing. Okay. Yeah. And then you try. Then I have to go for share step. screen. Yeah. Okay. And then PPT. Then choose, yeah. Then choose your PPT. Then okay. you'll I'll find take the, the desktop. Code. Otherwise, entire desktop. Yeah. Your PPT is running on the desktop only, now. Yes. yes. That's what yeah. I did. I actually opted for PPT only. Okay. So why can't you see the screen then? Again, I'll try once. I think you, you just go screen then yep. now is it visible yeah visible. yeah it is it is ah, it is okay, okay right. thank you okay thank you so much right so like uh, the topic for today is defining and achieving institutional effectiveness for transformation education and i'm associate professor from lots engineering college hyderabad telangana coming to the contents we have definition, modeling, and facilitation, then roll up institute in achieving, and followed by the other practices which the institute is following up in order to achieve that uh, effectiveness, and then comes to the outcomes. Now, coming to the definition part of you, when we talk about transformational education, education has actually been imparted with the help of a teachers, lecturers, professors, assistant professors, associate, and the professors. So basically, the transformation teachers actually should take a step ahead, stating that they should help the student in becoming metacritical participants. Metacritical participants in terms of learning process. So they have to be well practiced in it, which help them in goal setting and and they can reflect whatever they understand practically the real world etc and they need not be content focused that should be the actually uh, per uh, proposal of the teachers that can help the students to do that and then if in doing so they will become uh, inquiry based learning can be done service learning can be done project based learning can be done these are all the forms of transportational education then coming to the vision and mission of the college, you can see that the first part of it, which is actually saying that the Lodge Institute is actually striving continuously for excellence in professional education through quality, innovation, and teamwork. See, for an, for an education to be good at outcomes, you need to have quality into it followed by innovations. When you have innovation into it and quality into it, you will try to see that with the help of teamwork, the excellence and transformation educations can be achieved. So that is actually some part of it. Then we have measures. We have other things also where they are mentioning that how the quality of professional education can be increased. Coming to the next slide, which is modeling and facilitation in transformation learning. The first important part of it is what is the key of transformation learning? The first key in transformation learning is engaging the student as active learners. All the time, the student should be an active learner wherever he or she goes, whatever the circumstances that comes around, especially in the real world, they should be in a position to see that whatever they are learning, they can apply that learning into the real world and become problem solvers. That should be the key of transformation learning and that can be achieved with the help of the teachers. 
So the students actually request little guidance from the transformation teachers, especially in case of modeling and facilitation, allow the students to put their input and creativity that should be actually taken care by the teachers to see that keeping this into picture, like how much the student can be creative, that has to be enhanced, that has to be encouraged and help them in getting a crafted lesson, which help them in getting a crafted lesson that finally guide them for large learning objectives. So that is actually the perspective of it. And how are we doing the modeling part? That is analysis, synthesis, interpretation, and connection. Coming to analysis, how the student can analyze when it comes to the problem synthesis, how good they are when compared to the social things and all. Inter interpretation, how are they doing? For example, we, gi we gig up a layer world problem. So how are they doing the tablet, the tabulation part, the, the what we can say, the bar charts, all that. Connection, connection actually plays a very important role because actually we have made the students content focus like this. And so they don't have proper connection. Connection in a sense, they need to have a good relation with the people around them, which will help them to grow emotionally and even professionally. So that is actually important part which has to be taken care. Coming to the role, how our institute is actually achieving that, actually the transformation education is being achieved with the help of certain practices. That is NPTEL, we have ICT, we have patents, we have R&D, we have and self appraisal. These are certain practices which the Institute is following to see that the transformation education can be achieved. So each and every faculty member being there on the roles are supposed to undergo with all these steps, practices. Then only the self appraisal will be given. Self appraisal is actually an uh, what we can say, a uh, sort of self appraisal is nothing but a sort of form, which a, a form has been given to us for every year where you are supposed to fill in the entire details related to research and development works, patents, ICT, and PTL. Based on that, only the increment will be given. So when an institute compile you, when an institute compel you to see that all these practices are to be done, then only the your increment will be given. Means the entire, uh, what we can say, increment basically depends upon all this. So in that case, each and every faculty are imbibed to read that, that they have to follow all these terms and get that, what we can say, increment. So coming to the first part of it, which is NPDL, it has actually National Program of Technology Enhanced Learning. So this is basically a uh, 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 national program which has been running in order to enhance the quality of engineering and sciences education in country. How are they doing? They're actually providing a content. How is that content being framed based on undergraduate and postgraduate? So the curriculum has been made with the help of videos and best pay courses. Now this is basically what it's a teaching learning platform. So what is it doing? It is actually giving you a practical exposure of by considering the live example. If that is the case, it will be very helpful for the teachers, for the faculties, and even for the students to understand that content-based learning can be actually be applied for real-world learning, and this can be done easily with the help of these courses. So we can see that our college is actually got registered, like the, especially for Jan and April 2020, that is the recent semester, we had 492 students and 456 faculties got registered for the different courses. Until date, we have 205 FDP certification and the scorecards. And to add upon this, our college is actually one of the active local chapter compared to rest of the college in the nation. You can see some of the gold medalists who have got actually 90 plus percentage, the faculty, some of the faculties who have got the certification being done. They are supposed to write an exam. They are supposed to write some assignments and then finally an exam and there'll be uh, like online correction will be done and finally the certification will be given. So it is based on elite and the other things. So when you get 90 plus percentage, they will be giving you elite certificate. These are some of the achievements also by the NPDL people who have done. That is uh, one of them, that Nagiretti, sir, that is Nagiretti, Professor Nagiretti. He is actually an HOD from IT and is being taken as discipline star. 
coming to ICT, what is basically an ICT? ICT is information communication technology. What does it do? It actually helps in computing and communication facility, which features in what? Supporting teaching learning with a range of ed activities and education. It also extends learning opportunities beyond the classrooms. You can even access the global learning resources and information. It provides quality training resources and help keeping help in keeping skills updated. So lastly, we can say that ICT is actually the lifeblood of the modern research. Why it has been called like that? Because you can actually go for e-books, e-journals, e-magazine, e-newspapers. So you have a lot of uh, research papers, magazines, which can help you in doing your research. Uh, and some of these certificates, which our faculty from Lord's College got is uh, one, the two faculties who got certified in our ITC. Coming to patent granted, the first patent which you can see that is Safiuddin and Mr. Furhan is actually the one who have been granted by the state, the STP plant with an application number and even this is based on national. Some of the consultancy programs also we have been running. And the self-appraisal, as I said you, this is actually one of the sample of it. It's only the starting part of it I'm just showing. Coming to the outcome. So uh, as I said you, we had a role, which is actually the goal of it. Then we have certain practices, then comes the outcome. So when you come about the outcome, it is actually based on how much are you achieving it? So we have been awarded as a best innovator award at Ruler Innovator Startup, because actually India is still a developing country. It's not a developed country. So still we do require many of us in getting involved in how we can support the rural people there who are actually suffering with no house, no rent, no electricity, et cetera. So our students from Lord's College got best innovator award for that rural innovator startup 2017. And some of the students are being listed and under the guidance of our professor, that is of Safiuddin sir, and they have been award, awarded 50,000 crash pies also from the National Institute of Rural Development, Panchayat Raj, Ministry of Rural Government, Government of India. Then various other projects, which you can see, national level project exhibition, they have also proposed Echo Brick project, and that has been given as a, they have bagged second prize for the waste and low cost materials and good attempt for solve environmental issues, because actually uh, Telangana, is actually, it is, uh, though we have rainy season, but the climate becomes very humid. So, and also in summer also, we'll be going around 40 degrees, 45, something like that will happen. So echo bricks are actually being considered as one of the good salt, uh, one of the good uh, bricks, which uh, apart from the clay brick and the hollow blocks, etc., echo brick is being considered as one of the best bricks, which can help in maintaining the temperatures of the room. And even the second one, which is uh, the second one is innovative manhole for civet system pro uh, project. The, they actually got a special appreciation award in the same national level project exhibition that is three in one solution because actually, as I said you before at, uh, itself, India is a developing country. So during the rainy season, we face a lot of problem with potholes, with manholes and uh, even the road which has been laid has a lot of potholes in it. And although you do for repairing, again, you will be facing the same problem. So these people have actually, student of our college, have been, in, in a, uh, have been initiated a manhole setting in such a way that the problem solving of like rise of the water level in the manhole can be, uh, can be taken care, followed by opening of it, followed by uh, what we can say, pumping out of the excess water that has also been considered in innovative manhole for civet system. This is actually termed to be the best. And so they have been given a special appreciation award. The last one, which is water scarcity exploitation for remote villages. This has also been given as a, a patent, which I said you last. Yeah, this one. Sewage treatment plant, this is actually given by the state government for the proposal which they have given during this part, that is incubation part. So this has been taken care by the state based on the proposal which our college people, the faculty have been provided.
So this is my basic conclusion. So the goal of it is actually the title. The practices is actually which I have mentioned you the same. And coming to the outcome, as I mentioned you the uh, the three parts of it. That is the best innovator awards which our faculty and the students have bagged. And coming to the next part, which is the second prize, special appreciation awards for the manholes and etc. And the last one, which is this water scarcity, because may, many of the places are having water problem. Many of the states are having that problem, and so they are being given and uh, given a patent filed by the students of uh, by the students and even faculty to how will you try to provide water? Like how will you resolve water scarcity problem in remote villages? I uh, thank you all. If you have any doubts, you can ask me. And thank you, Dr. Astro Fatima. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation and sharing your experience. So, till now, we do not have any questions from the audience in, in the platform. Uh, is, is there anyone from the speakers? Any questions? So if there is no, no questions, um, I'd like to thank you again for your presentation. Okay. And thank you, sir. we'd like to move to our- Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So we'd like to move to our third present, uh, third speaker, Dr. Kamil Mohammed. The title is Impact of Institutional Infrastructure Towards Student Intellectual Growth. Dr. Kamal. Uh, hello, everyone. Dr. Astra, you can stop sharing, Dr. Astra. Hello, everyone. Please I'm stop the sharing. You, you have, right? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, everyone uh, sees my, uh, my topic. And uh, I welcome everyone, namely Dr. Tagba Musa, Dr. Astra Fatima from my college, Dr. Professor Motarul and our co-speaker, our uh, moderator. Okay. Uh, basically, as the Dr. Asra Fatima said, we actually I'm from LIT as well, Lord Institute of Engineering and Technology. Uh, a little about Lord's Institute. Basically, this is the first and the most famous institute in India that belongs to the minority class of India, Muslim minority. And it's the only autonomous institute of such strength. So I welcome everyone to the Law Institute. I, Dr. Kamil Muhammad, is the Associate Professor from IT Department. Just now, Asra Fatima uh, had the, given a glimpse of uh, Dr. K. Nagaradi, my HOD, head of the department. He is the seventh star of NPTEL and has been passed seven such certificates in elite category. Okay, uh, a little about myself. Uh, I had my uh, studies and my foreign education from England. I studied from University of Westminster long back in 2009. I studied my PhD from University of Sheffield. I recently moved to India and I was awarded a, core, uh, a job in as associate professor in IT department. Uh, coming to my topic, yeah. Uh, basically, my topic is impact of institution infrastructure to a student's intellectual growth. Uh, why I choose this topic? Because this is one of my chapter uh, from my, uh, from my uh, paper. So let me uh, talk a little on this. Uh, basically, it has an abstract, which I'll let you know soon, and an executive summary, why the better spaces for learning are required, and how we can maximize the benefits of pedagogy and the college competences relationship and then we have implications for future practice and implications for future research okay, just let me remove this college community okay coming on this um, my abstracts says a little about how what i have encountered with the with the effectiveness of these students mostly from india bangladesh and pakistan and sri lanka that we form the subcontinent that they have actually come here to form the uh, form 
hurdles to how they overcome the, before the student juxtaposed for the sake of his career and responsible right track. So infrastructure for any city or college, universities are formed by the background and backbone of a student's wellness and form the basis of his sweet memories to cherish with him as he grows along. So you can imagine like basically what we, we are promising the students. We are promising the students like after four years of engineering life, after graduation, like they'll be encountering many difficulties, so some milestones and difficult tasks in order to overcome. And what we are providing them, an education in the form of colleges, uh, in the form of in structure of uh, you know syllabus. And we are just concentrating on the syllabus. Why are we not concentrating on something like they, where they are sitting, what they are actually observing? Are they having enough benefits like any uh, right resources like how foreign education and foreign universities are providing to them, to the other students. And here, that's why the college should be hygienic and nicely maintained in order to provide a pleasant atmosphere for the students to relax and enjoy studies when he first steps into the era of transformational education. Okay, that is actually my track which I based as uh, my one of the paper. So encountering this, let me move to the next slide. So we need to answer, do all students have access to the place at college? Okay. Uh, what, what, what I mean by this is basically uh, we have an, uh, you know, an, an evolution. Like uh, we don't want certain category of students not to step further down the ground at a specific time. Uh, why do we have this? I don't know. And we, we, we ask some students, you know, you're not allowed in the library at this certain time. No. Colleges are the, colleges are the uh, next house or a home for others when they leave the, their proper place, leaving their relations, relatives and their, you know, the families. And they want to come to the college. The very first thing they should feel that we should not have an access. Uh, we should have access to all the places at the college. Do the college building provide a safe and safe and healthy environment? Are the existing learning spaces optimally designed for learning? Does the design of the college foster current pedagogy? What I mean by pedagogy is nothing but the institutions, uh, you know, the, the course structure, what we are to, teaching them. It's like tuitions and community engagement. How can the college infrastructure be designed to allow sustainability over the longer term? So we need to answer this. And I hope in the question and answer section, I, I need some from the audiences to at least uh, have a ponder on these questions so that uh, you know it will be helpful for us to achieve a little a milestone so that we, if you can answer this we are we are trying to literally work for the betterment of these students in the future terms okay so what actually again coming on the betterment of the better space for learning okay so we should have a good natural condition such as lighting air quality, temperature control, acoustics, and links to nature. Uh, see, if you compare, if you can see the website of Lord Institute of Engineering and Technology, we have a huge garden. We have two sports ground, okay? We have separate space, uh, sports room. We have almost ACs in all the classrooms and the uh, labs. We have good acoustics at, at least two to three seminar hall. And that's why we are linking the students in order to come and enjoy and feel relaxed. And you know, they should find this as a, a place they should love to uh, not to miss every day. So that is what we are trying to achieve that they should not be any absentees each day. Uh, Lord Institute of Engineering Technology is holding around 2,500 students by different places of Hyderabad. All people are coming from different sectors, sections and different towns. There are almost 15 to 20 buses that comes every day to the college, bring all the pupils and the the students uh, and the teachers. Age appropriate learning spaces that offer flexible learning opportunities that people can adapt and personalize. So we are actually holding you know, MTech courses and such courses which are welcoming uh, middle-aged uh, students as well, like people probably from 29 to 30 onwards also can take these courses and be benefited with them. Uh, so it's it's a it's a good platform for me basically to express my gratitude to the Inforo so that we can give this a platform like what Lord's Institute of Engineering Technology is welcoming us 
or others in the whole of the country and thereby connections between learning spaces that are easy to navigate and may provide additional learning opportunities like what dr astra fatima just now ponder about nptl and different kinds of icp and e cell she might have forgotten and there is something like uh, uh, you know tbi there are different branches what lord institute of engineering technology is holding on so that we can you know take a extreme steps in order to build the students or come and enjoy and you know appreciate the uh, the different uh, what branches what we are holding in a level of ambient stimulation using color and visual complexity because we don't want our colleges to be dull and they should be in a state where you can you know invite everyone there should be some advertisements going on there are some should be hoardings that in uh, inculcating everyone to um, you know enjoy each and every aspect of each semester because semester almost last for probably let's say 8 to 12 weeks so that means almost 3 three months of uh, working days but if you see on on calendar there might be less than two and a half months so that's why because you know there are holidays and india is rich in culture we have so, so many holidays around and that's why we cannot be able to meet what we are planning to do in a semester and that's why we fell back and we pulled it in the next semester that's why prostican 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 the terms into the next uh, domain that's why you know we are we are trying to invite everyone and we want the designs that took into account local climatic and cultural conditions so that's what you can find you know the next terms to the uh, nature like we want every people to be more you know useful when when they, 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 find, they find themselves useful when they come to the college and uh, take the benefits okay so my next thing is how to maximize the how to maximize the benefits of pedagogy and the college community relationship in order to maximize the positive impacts of college infrastructure investment there is emerging evidence that the term fit i i repeat the word the term fit between the physical layout of college and institutional practice is important that what pedagogical practice is important because we are just uh, asking the students to come and learn what the syllabus but what we are practicing what we need to practice is how to make them go live and it was been done in 1970s and 80s we want something very useful for the students when they are just Uh, you know, very new to the institute, uh, to the market, when they finished. Okay. There are also pervasive arguments that engaging a wide range of stakeholders that can increase the value of education being delivered. This is a very important aspect because we want these stakeholders that can you know come and uh, look into the education prospective. How can they help us? So in the same way, having a better shared understanding of how the design of college. infrastructure affects educational outcome is very useful and those doing education sector work the evidence presented in this report which are writing paper that the wider range of salient factors can be addressed for the same amount of expenditure this is what we are uh, you know finding ourselves in the unique uh, uh, way to express our ways in order to invite the candidates of the students uh, by hold, holding different carnivals at the college and we are trying to make uh, annual days we make them you know a third party progress so that you know the stakeholders should basically uh, think as a project in order to help the students around and, and make the college you know look uh, because they, they should find themselves to better projects and to meet the specific needs of the students we student teachers and our staff are asking the different kind of questions around every time when we uh, when we are having feedbacks that should have a positive impact on the educational outcomes okay what will do it will increase the efficiency of the resources invested in college infrastructure projects and will lead to more effective cooperation between the different specialties involved in the development of college infrastructure okay so coming on the you know implications of future research cross cultural comparative impact evaluation studies would be available to explore the issues of the optimal provision of places to the choice of college disposition and size see 
having have such a big size of the colleges and the universities because of uh, lords is going to be an autonomous it's an autonomous institute now it is no more than a university the evidence for the importance of safe and healthy colleges should be encountered to promote learning is strong but investigations are urgently needed into how to make this happen effectively in the context of existing country level regulation what we mean by country level regulation is the you know aict norms we have ugc norms they should take into account and the they should provide the stakeholders to us so i it's say it's an appeal like it's a it's a welcoming uh, projects to them basically a technology has an important role to play in education but the technology is chosen need to be appropriate for each specific college again the institutional approach and learning environment because uh, we are targeting an audience somewhere in south india having a minor culture so our technology is nation but this one could not handle we need to study this so we want the stakeholders to take this opportunity therefore more research needs to be done to align the use of technology with the needs of colleges including not only learning spaces but also college planning and construction as well because i i i have studied in uk i have seen worked in dubai i worked in india i have seen different kind of cultures and what is important and lucrative for the students to you know come to college and make them feel uh, the place to gather knowledge and you know put it in the right right stream okay and uh, i think i am done with this uh, because i have just one or two topics now okay about future research again there is also a need of generate evidence from the infrastructure projects implemented in different contexts like from low to upper middle class income towns and cities as well as from colleges in different geographical locations and with students from different cultural background because we are from again i said from hyderabad and most of the towns let's say about 15 to 20 miles do come to this uh, to the college to study we are we are forgetting to target the uh, the students which are come in this category with their family will come into this category because we are minority institute and an autonomous as well so oh, we should have the upper hand from the other uh, stakeholders like ugc and uh, aict and uh, delhi university like aiu association of indian universities that they should ponder on this in order to raise the values and uh, you know uh, the concepts for the students for the uh, research so that uh, we can have a hands on these as well and by think i i have end my session because this is one of the chapter from my uh, this thing so you know, i am happy if if anybody can ponder on this and raise some questions uh, i hope i have done with this uh, thank you everyone uh, thank you dr kavil mohammad uh, just uh, nice sharing from your experiences thank you dear. so there is no questions from the audience on vertex platform but if uh, anyone here from the panelist uh, want to ask any question please go ahead So uh, I, I do not know much about your institute. Uh, I just want to ask you that uh, the student yeah, good. pool, uh, the student pool you are uh, getting in each um, starting mm -hmm. the freshmen, uh, are they uh, are they up to your expectation? I mean, their level uh, of well, uh, well uh, learning. well mr mr rahman i yes. i appreciate your question yeah basically if you look on our website basically we are almost 20 21 years old now well, and you know, my, are... motive, my my main actually i want what i want to know if it is not up to your expectation how do you manage uh, what else you do to to cover up their intellectual yeah. growth because the intellectual growth i think uh, also requires the, the, that them they are mm, uh, put foundation knowledge right, right? Uh, yeah see, uh, 
Yeah, you're right. Basically, what I think is uh, like the platform what InfoRobe has introduced us in our college. We are abiding their infrastructures in order to, you know, interrupt their their uh, their, their uh, events, like inviting all the students and you know uh, the the audiences around. We have a clientele basically. In order to target them, we have such sports, such events, such branches, and such uh, like you could say cells, e cells, like what just Dr. Cells. We have you know inventory cells. We have innovation cells. We have uh, apart from studies, we are trying to guide the students so that they become the um, face image in the market. You know, the, the students outside who are passing and going outside, they will actually let the world know what Lord's is, Lord Institute of Engineering Technology. So we are trying to invite all these facilities which are being guided from InfoRobe. So I'm very thankful to InfoRobe who is giving a platform for such and actually discussing the in and shortcomings and the in boons and banes of all the sessions, what uh, object-based education is all about. This is what object-based education is. Uh, we don't want students to just pass. We want students to be entrepreneur. They should create the job. So we are working ahead for this. And inshallah, I hope the targeting audience, what we have as a minority institute, uh, we are alhamdulillah doing very good. And almost 500 to 800 students get placed every every year. So that's a very good, great job you're doing. And I, I appreciate if any, any, any questions, if anyone wants to ask, I, I hope I answer the question. Any other questions from the speakers? Okay, uh, if there is no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Kamal Muhammad again for your presentation. I'm obliged, I'm obliged, thank you. And uh, we are going to move our last speaker, Dr. Motaharul Islam from United Nations University. And his presentation title is Outcome-Based Education and the Student Awareness in the Developing Countries. Dr. Motahar, please uh, proceed. Your screen is visible. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Mashukur Rahman, uh, for giving me the floor. I would also like to, I mean, thank all the, I mean, speaker in this session. And as you mentioned, uh, my topics, my topic is outcome-based education and students' awareness in the developing countries. So let me proceed so uh, this presentation is actually based on my own experience it is a more than a decade so um, i have started my journey from 2008 with this outcome based education and um, i have served in different universities home and abroad and uh, now i am serving united international university bangladesh as a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. So based on my practical experience, I will try my best to demonstrate, although it's a very, I mean, big topics, but I will try to demonstrate within the specified time period. So uh, these are the brief outlines of, of this session. Now, I will be starting with the definition provided by Professor Dr. William Spady, the founder and uh, info, founder of Infor-OB and father of OB concept. So he has mentioned before a long time, outcome-based education means starting with a clear picture of what is important for students to be able to do, then organizing the curriculum, instruction and assessment. And ultimately, we make sure that it is it happens. Okay, so you see the definition from this definition, outcome-based education is basically 
for the students and empowering for empowering the students or the, for the empowering the learners so if the students are not aware of the concept of outcome based education definitely it is very difficult as a import as an important stakeholder in this process the students must be aware of the system so that they might wholeheartedly accept the concept for their own development okay so you see for this concern worldwide we we see there are a lot of efforts for the quality assurance in the university level education so we have different accords and all of these accords are to ensure the quality of the graduates. So we see the Washington Accord, the Sydney Accord, and the Dublin Accord, three different accords that addresses three different, I mean, uh, perspective for the engineering graduate, technologist, and technicians. So you know that for the Education Accord, there are different countries as well as some other countries that are going to be the signatory of these accords. So what are actually the concern of Washington Accord, Sydney Accord and Dublin Accord? You see, they have some common aspects, but especially the Washington Accord you see it assists the mobility of professional engineers. They are concerned of the professional engineers and also the engineering at the professional level. You see the Sydney Accord, they deal with engineering technology. That means it is the technology part and it, it, you see, it also recognizes the importance of the roles of engineering technologists as part of a wider engineering team. And the last one, the Dublin Accord, you see educational base for engineering technicians. So it recognizes the importance of the roles engineering technician play as part of a wider engineering team. So three different accords are for three different professional engineers engineering technologists and engineering technicians. Well, let us proceed. So all these sort of accords are basically for the students quality assurance. So you see the different countries of the Washington Accord, 20 different countries for the full membership. And there are some provisional members in Sydney Accord, you see 11 countries and two provisional members. And for the Dublin Accord, there are nine full members. You see here, the Washington Accord, as I told you that this accord is for the professional graduate engineers. And Sydney Accord for the technologist and the Dublin Accord for the technician. Now, actually you see, what, why do we, I mean, need three different accord. You see here, it is their knowledge profile for the Washington Accord, WK1 means knowledge profile for the Washington Accord and knowledge profile for the Sydney Accord and for the Dublin Accord. You see the first, I mean, five, it's common, this, 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 I mean, profile are common for all the accords, but you see from the, Knowledge Profile 6, it mentions engineering practice. Here, engineering technologies. And you see the practical engineering knowledge. And also, Washington Accord you see, emphasizes on the research, since it is the professional engineers, so research literature. In Sydney Accord, it emphasizes on technological literature. And in here you see, they don't have 
the, this is a techn, techn, technician, of course. So the comprehension is necessary for them, but not that much research is required. Okay, fine. Now you see why our graduate should be aware of the accreditation and why they will take it very positively as an important stakeholders. Because you know, the accreditation process, it is for ensuring the standard, okay? So that the student from the developing country, they can easily migrate from the developing country to the developed country. Sometimes it happens that the students have the four years graduation, but when they are moving towards another country, that graduation has been taken as the diploma or high diploma. Even many good quality universities are facing this sort of problem when they are graduating from the developing countries. So the we need the accreditation for the proper adjustment. You see that it also increased and enhanced employment opportunities. Now we are living in a global village. So the graduate of one country are traveling towards another country. So the accreditation, it increases and enhance the opportunities for the job. And it has also the national and international recognition. You see, it ensures con continuous quality improvement because the CQI process, the continuous quality improvement, it is one of the major concern for any accreditation, accreditation system. And you see, it also control the graduates, how it control the, how the accreditation process control the quality of the graduate, we will see when we will, I mean, uh, pros, I mean, cover the different graduate at attributes. Well, let's proceed. Now you see why the concept of OBE is important for quality assurance and why it is important for the engineering graduates. I have demonstrated an advertisement that has been published in the Sydney Morning Herald in the year 2005. Some of the companies, they are searching for the engineering graduate. So you see, if you are a final year mechanical electrical telecommunication or computer engineering students apply for engineering graduate career program, impress us with your, this sort of qualities. What are those? Well-developed communication and team skill, aptitude for developing positive business partnership, ability to look outside the square, aptitude for independent problem solving, strong interpersonal and organizing skills, and enthusiastic and proactive approach. You see here, it is in the, they are looking for engineering graduate, but we have a lot of soft skill, a lot of interpersonal skill, a lot of teamwork, many things. It is not only focusing the technical skill. So the, the OB, it is ensuring that the graduate will, I mean, acquire all sort of skills that might be required for their professional development in the real life field. So students mu must be aware of these issues. Okay, now you see for quality assurance, we have two different types of accredi accreditation process. One is for the institutional and another, another is for the program level accreditation. For example, the institutional accreditation, it is normally rendered by the apex body of a particular country in Bangladesh, in India, in other countries. It is sometimes it's called the University Grants Commission. They provide the accreditation for the whole university or for the whole institutions. But the, I mean, out in outcome-based education, you see we are getting the accreditation for program or specific program, for example, computer science and engineering, for chemical engineering, 
for civil engineering, for a specific program. So this is the program-wise accreditation process. So in both of the way, we can ensure the quality. Now, I would like to briefly provide some concept or terminologies for the outcome-based education. You see, first of all, we deal with the course outcome. Okay, so what is course outcome? You see, it is the ability to attain by the student upon the completion of a subject. So each and every subject must have some course outcome. So after the, I mean, completion of that particular course, if you want to judge the student, how you will be judging? So it is the course level, okay? Then you see the program outcome. Sometimes we call that, I mean, graduate attributes, PO or graduate attributes or program learning attributes. All this, these are almost same. So the PO, it is normally assessed after the graduation. Okay, when the student will be graduating, at that time, we will assess the program outcomes or the graduate attributes. And we also, while designing the curriculum, we must also map the CO with one or more of the program outcomes for a specific program. Now, we will be focusing on why the student must be aware of. You know, student is the main stakeholder of the accreditation process or the quality enrichment process. So for whom we are, we are doing this sort of research? Of course, it is they are our beloved students. So we are doing something good for them, but if they doesn't accept it in a positive way, it must have a detrimental effect. In the developing countries, many universities are, I mean, suffering for these issues because we don't have sufficient campaign for the student awareness. What is happening? Student are, students are in darkness. We are thinking for the students, but if we, the students and the thinking process are not synchronized, then we cannot, I mean, get some better result from our efforts. So first of all, we should must, I, we must, I, I mean, uh, aware them for the graduate attributes, okay? And what are the, I mean, outcome of the graduate attributes for their future career, it must be, will explain to the student. So here we'll be I'm explaining 12 different graduate attributes that has been adapted based on the, based on the Washington Accord and from the EBIT and many other organizations. You see, first of all, the engineering knowledge. So this is the very fundamental program outcome or graduate attributes, okay? So it means that the knowledge of mathematics, science, engineering fundamental, and engineering specialization to solve the complex engineering problem. So the word complex engineering problem, what is the meaning of complex engineering problem? It has different attributes. So if a particular problem, complex engineering problem may not be complex at all, but it may be easier but it is, it's, it's, it's term is the complex engineering problem. So you see, if the student doesn't aware of that, if the student, I mean, just simply read it, the POs of a particular program, they may be getting some negative impact. So maybe this sort of OBE or this sort of, I mean, process, it is imposing something difficult for us. So it may have a detrimental effect for the uh, students. So complex engineering problem means it must satisfy some terms and conditions. So completion problem is not the complex problem all the time. It might be easier, but it should follow the, some guidelines provided by different, I mean, uh, bodies. For example, the, the depth of knowledge required. Okay. For example, the, I mean, uh, the modern tools uses, for example, the, I mean, uh, research literature, many th issues, it might be incorporated. So this is the first one, the engineering knowledge. The second one, you see the problem analysis. So this ability will prove. Dr. Dr. Mother, uh, yes, your time is uh, your time is over. Uh, we appreciate if you can 
conclude very shortly. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Mashikur Rahman. So, problem analysis you see here, it through this, I mean, uh, I mean, um, a program outcome. So, student will be able to identify, formulate research literature and analyze complex engineering problems. Okay, so this you see the design and development of solutions. So, the student must be able to design solutions for complex engineering problems. And one important thing is you see, they must, I mean, understand they, this design, it is for the public, it must have, they must consider for the public health, safety, cultural, societal, and environmental considerations. Now the investigation, modern tools uses, and you see up to the five, I, I mean, I mean PO5, these are the technical, I mean, technical issues. Now, from six onward, you will see most of the things are for the society, are for the teamwork, are for the lifelong learning. So it is, um, it is reshaping the students, I mean, or it's preparing the students for the market so that they can work accordingly for the society. They can communicate better in, for the, uh, for, for with other students. You see, it also, I mean, emphasizes on environment and sustainability, okay? How they can contribute to the environment and how the technology can be sustainable. And it also provides the ethical, strong ethical background. So it is very important for the students of engineering uh, discipline. You see, we, we, before we had a very limited opportunity to teach the ethics for the engineers. Now, through the outcome-based education, it's very much possible to teach some of the courses based on the engineering ethics. And you see individual and teamwork. So the, the engineers must work, I mean, in a team or sometimes in a, in, in individually. So they must be aware of that. Also the communication, sometimes they need to write uh, some effective report for the documentation, okay? The, our, the in developing country, engineers are, I mean, they are lagging behind for writing a quality report for the documentation. So through the OB, they can also be, also, I mean, aware of these issues and the project management, you see, I mean, once upon a time, the prof engineers, they will be leading or they'll be in the, playing the managerial role. So they must have some knowledge for the project management. And the finally, the most important thing is the lifelong learning. So in the field of engineering, you see the students, they are lifelong learners, okay? So how they will be solving new problem? They might have the knowledge, but based on their existing knowledge, how they can solve some unseen problem or how they can solve some unstructured problem. So these are really very important. So throughout this PO, the student, we can reshape the, I mean, students, I mean, uh, learning capacities or the, the, their, their attitude and their aptitude level also. So, you see, and Dr. we Dr. also- Mother, uh, we yes, are please. out of time. Okay, I think Can that's, that's just... all That's all for my, I mean, um, presentation. So thank you so much. And if you have any questions, we can uh, further discuss. Okay, uh, there is actually no questions from the audience through the verdict platform. Uh, is there any questions from the speakers? Yes, please. Thank you yes. so much, Professor. You are most welcome. Yeah. Uh, just I would like to know how to measure, how to measure these outcomes. Is there any specific procedure can be used? Just uh, it is already well written forms or anything it can help to, to measure this, these outcomes or not? Yeah, you, you know, um, for uh, while designing the, I mean, uh, OB-based curriculum, First of all, we design the course, different courses, right? Different courses, CEO, the course outcome. Yes, and sure. all the all the course outcome, it must be mapped to the program outcomes. Yes. So program outcomes, it might be, I mean, your own designed, or you, yeah. you may adapt from some other organizations or mm -hmm. the accreditation bodies for uh, in your country. Okay. Then you'll have to map all the course outcomes to the few program outcomes, okay? So yes. how, how, how will be, the, the question is how you will be, I mean, assessing those, right? 
So yes, you can yes. assess, you can yes. assess those, for example, by different assessment tool and technique for exams. There are, there are some formative assessment, the continuous assessment, exams, quizzes, assignment, case studies, okay, or class performance in different ways, you will be judging the course outcome and ultimately those course outcome will be hitting towards the program outcomes. Yes, sure. Just um, uh, I mean, specifically, I need to know how to, to measure the soft skills, actually, really. Okay. For example, communication skill, right? Yes. Uh, you as know, an example. Uh, for example, we, we have the, I mean, uh, finally a design project, right? And we have some courses, for example, in computer science courses, we, we used to teach the system analysis and design or some other courses. So where we used to uh, provide some sort of, I mean, uh, presentation, right? So through the presentation, you can easily judge or assess their, I mean, this sort of communication skill or soft skill. Mm. So it is, it's not possible for the exam, but throughout the presentation or case studies or other approaches, we can perform this. I think it's clear to you. Yeah, yes, thank you so much. I'm just uh, trying to find a way to measure what I'm, I'm doing with my students now, just uh, in this integration of soft engineering societies. So I asked to find some solution to how to measure the outcomes uh, of, uh, of our, to, to measure the impact of our, our work among the students, especially in uh, the social and emotional learnings. So, but okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any other questions? I have one question. Uh, uh, most, in most universities, the certificate or transcript is given in terms of grade point average. We call it GPA or CGPA, right? So how the student will be motivated if we do not change this way of certification? If we do not include the uh, their scores in the graduate attributes, or we can say the program outcomes in the certificate or transcript, right? Better about that. Okay, actually, you see, this is a very I'm uh, there's a long debate for these issues, and um, uh, recently I'm reading one I mean book from Professor Dr. Spady. It is it is um, actually. Uh, outcome-based education, empowering essence, okay? So, you know, this sort of scoring system, basically, it is time-bounded, right? Yes. Okay, for, for example, one trimester it is four, four months, okay? Some students can grab something very easily, but the same thing, if the other student get six-month time, they can also grab and they can get the, I mean, same type of grades, right? Right. Okay. That's why uh, the outcome-based education is not only for the grading perspective. It is, it, is, it is dedicated for developing the student skill. That's why everywhere we are trying to develop the student skill, what they can do, okay? And another, in another way, actually, I mean, there is a little relationship between the score as well as the skill. So, you know, while we are, we are I mean, uh, implementing the outcome-based education, okay? So sometimes we may not, we may not judge all the courses. We may, we may take some sort of, I mean, prototype courses, okay? But this, you mean, I mean the sample courses and we can judge and we can get some ideas, but for the result and for the GPA calculation, we need to, I mean, consider all the courses, right? Right. Right. So you, what you mean is uh, we need to give them some scores anyway to, to motivate right. them, but one student may not perform well from the very first year, right? But right. He, can, he or she can perform well uh, at the Let end of their, uh, yeah, at the end of the, their bachelor degree, right? So, yes. so maybe we can think of better scoring algorithm or something like that to 
Well, actually, I just wanted to add this uh, because GPA is actually an Indian point of view perspective. What we are answering to the uh, norms that CBSC guys are being entertained in foreign universities with the accreditation level, not with the marks level, like the percentage level. This is what I found when I was in UK, when I was studying, they're asking my uh, you know, credits. We were running on percentages then. <laughs> And it was nowhere, you know, matching of these. So as uh, Professor Islam has said, like this is a better and the time domain, you know, it's a time-based. So we can decide like, uh, we are not actually inculcating a single guy. If you give a 9.7 as a CGP, that actually inculcates more than people who are between 97%, 87%, 81%, 91%. So that's a better, uh, I think, uh, the grading system, I think, at this moment of time. I'm, I'm really thankful to Professor Islam. And that was a nice uh, 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 presentation from your side. And uh, thank you, everyone. I think. Okay. Uh, thank you.